At 22, my net worth was negative $38,000. Fast forward eight years later, at 29, I had crossed the $1 million mark. These are the five lessons that I learned that definitely could have helped me get there sooner. Lesson one, as an enterprise account executive, I had this old manager who would always give us this mini little pep talk before our QBRs. And a QBR stands for a quarterly business review. This is a really important meeting that happens every single quarter where you present in front of your team as well as your manager. And the objective is to tell everybody how you're going to hit your sales quota for the quarter as well as for the rest of the year. And to give you a peek behind the curtain, sometimes your quota might be higher than what your territory might potentially produce or might be greater than what you currently have in pipeline. Regardless though, you absolutely cannot go out there and tell everyone that. And so the sales manager would always be sure to remind us. And the way he did it, I'll never forget. He'd have his little kickoff speech, he'd wrap up the past quarter or the past year, and then he would say something to the effect of, Guys, some of you have dog accounts, but that's why we hired you. Get up there and dare to dream. And if the number you put up there does not scare you, you need to dream bigger. And I'll be lying to you if during those meetings, I wasn't a little bit nervous because here I am with a $2 million number. I see my territory can produce realistically one five, one eight, but I've got to go up there and tell them how I'm going to hit a two and a half or $3 million potential. But now I look back on it and it taught me a really powerful lesson. And that is the fact that you got to set goals, but you have to set goals that push you out of your comfort zone. Because by putting out there that I've got a potential to hit 2.5 or 3 million, whether I believe it or not, it's out there. It forces me then to back into it. It forces me to look at potential opportunities of there's an upsell here. There's a cross sell here. How am I going to go and deliver against the two, five, three million dollar goal I set? And if I fall short, then I'm at least going to hit my quota versus being comfortable and saying, realistically, I don't know if I'm going to do it. The other thing is if realistically you tell your sales manager, you can't hit your quota, you're going to be out the door. So don't do that. So the lesson here is dare to dream. Get comfortable with the slightly uncomfortable, because if 2024 is the year you're going to build tremendous wealth, you have to put targets out there that are going to get you there and then some, because if you fall short, then you're at least much further than if you had just set your target at the exact goal you're going for. The worst thing that you can do for yourself is count yourself out. The worst thing you can do for yourself is just kind of float around hoping that somehow you're going to stumble into something. It's not going to happen that way. You have to be intentional. You have to set goals and you have to dare to dream. And the way I apply the lesson of setting goals is very simple. January, 2021, I set a goal to start a YouTube channel and make one video a week. At the time, I thought that was just the biggest commit ever. That meant I had script. I'd have to shoot. I'd have to edit. I'd have to do all of that and send it to Nobody, because I literally had zero subscribers. But I'm so thankful I did set that goal and we did meet those metrics because now we've got about 4.5 million aggregate followers. Talking all things money from YouTube to TikTok to Instagram. Lesson two. This one I learned as a pharmaceutical sales rep way back in the day. I still remember I must have been two, three months on the job. The way a pharmaceutical sales rep makes money is they sell drugs, legally of course. And the way you do that is you talk to doctors, NPs, PAs, people who can prescribe the drugs. And the way you talk to them is either you wait in the hallway from when they go from one patient room to another and you have maybe 20, 30 seconds, or you sign up to cater an office lunch. And lunch and learns are pretty difficult to come by because most offices are gonna cater one or two lunches a week and that's it. So they'll book out 12 months in advance. I was very lucky when I first started that my mentor on the job helped me sign up for lunch and learn day one. And so three months later, I was catering my first lunch. Coming to this meeting, I was excited. I was prepped. I had my demo pen. I had my pitch. I had my samples. I had everything. I knew kind of where the doctor stood on the medication. So I was like, okay, I've got some objections I need to handle. So I was feeling good. I walk into the office. I'm catering 99 restaurants. We got the steak tips, the turkey tips, the salad. It's good. Office staff comes in. They're eating. I'm chatting. I'm feeling good. Okay, here we go. And then the doctor walks in. All right, John, here you go. You've been prepping for this. I get all my materials and I just kind of start going at it, taking them through the pitch, asking the questions that I wanted to ask, waiting for the objections. But there was no dialogue. There was no engagement. All I got was, mm-hmm, yeah, okay, oh yeah, oh uh, yeah, uh-huh. And then in between, I'm, I'm answering, I'm trying to talk and he's just chewing, chewing, chewing. And I'm getting nervous, right? I'm, I'm seeing he's going through the food on his plate. I'm getting stonewalled. I'm getting nowhere. And within maybe five, 10 minutes, he was done out. And I couldn't have felt more defeated because here I was just hyping myself up for this lunch, ready to go. And before I knew it, it was done. I got next to nothing out of it other than feeding this office for free, which that's not my job. So I pack up, I get back in the car, 
I pick up the phone and I call my colleague and we'll call her Mary. And I tell Mary everything that happened. And after listening to me rant for about five minutes straight, she said this, and I still remember this quote to a day and it's kind of a motto I live by. She just goes, John, we're salespeople. We don't get what we don't ask for. The worst thing that the doctor can say is no, but guess what? You're gonna come back in another month. You're gonna come back in two months and you're gonna ask again. And as a reminder, I was two or three months into my first corporate job ever and my first sales job ever, and I never really thought about it that way. I always thought, well, you gotta kinda earn it and you gotta really be engaged. And then when it seems like your friends then you make the ask, but Mary was right. You don't get what you don't ask for. And my fatal flaw is I didn't make an ask. I didn't make an ask for a commitment. I didn't make an ask for whether or not he would write for the medication. Whether or not he would have said yes or no, that's a discussion for a different day. That's more of my sales craft. But at the end of the day, as a salesperson, you have to make the ask. And for me, I took that conversation in that quote, you don't get what you don't ask for, and I applied it to every aspect of my life. Of course, I continued on my sales career going from pharmaceutical to tech sales, but in my tech sales job, in my first job, it was setting meetings, make the ask, make the close. And then from that job, when I moved into a closing role, it was making the ask and getting commitments from the right key decision holders and just generally in life, a hotel upgrade, airplane upgrade, getting late fee waves. It's going on and making the ask. And if someone says no, so they say no, it's not gonna be the end of the world. And that one particular quote set me on the path to build an invaluable skill, sales. And I know some people are out there thinking, oh, there's no way I could possibly build sales skills. Thing is, you probably can. I never thought I'd be a salesperson, truly. I was pretty introverted in high school. I'm not that particularly extroverted, but at the end of the day, Sales can be broken into a couple things, one of which is finding a problem, solving the problem, and making the ask and closing the business. And so is everyone gonna be a successful salesperson? No, but is a sales a skill that you can definitely work on? Absolutely, and is it an important skill? For sure. And one of the ways that you can apply sales skills without actually having to sell a product is when you go into negotiating for a raise or when you go negotiate for a new job. That right there is all sales skills. It's the ability to close the interviewer on the job or the ability to negotiate for yourself a 10, 15, 20% raise, or if not, you're looking elsewhere. And how I've applied this lesson to content creation is when it comes to negotiating for brand opportunities, I will make the ask to get to know. Once we get to know, then we can start negotiating, but I'm never one to sell myself short. I've always been rather aggressive in my brand deal negotiations, but I think that's partly what I was taught, both in my tech sales career, where you've got to dare to dream and set some big goals, but also in my pharma sales career, where I was taught that you just got to make the ask. If you want a six-figure brand deal, you've got to make the ask for a six-figure brand deal because nobody is going to just give that to you. And what I found is if they're not going to give that to you, that's fine. They'll likely counter with something. Great. And then you can negotiate off of the counter, but never be the one to count your yourself out. Lesson three, flashback, May 2016. Here I am, the son of immigrants, two years away from finishing in pharmacy school and then graduating into a stable and prestigious job as a pharmacist. But something felt off because throughout pharmacy school, I didn't actually know how I felt about it. I didn't know how I felt about the job prospects, which weren't good. I didn't know how I felt about the pay, which was capped. And three, I didn't know if I actually wanted to be a pharmacist because pharmacy school was always a backup to medical school, which I decided that I didn't wanna to go to. But then what do I do? Going into P3 and P4 year meant the graduate years. These were the years that I was gonna to have to now spend an additional $100,000. But if I left, did I just put six years of schooling to waste? What's the use of having three bachelor's degrees in biology, psychology, and pharmaceutical sciences without getting the farm D? And I still remember the two scenarios. On one end, I would just start graduating, I would start working and start paying off student loan debt, and I would already have a positive net worth in two years. On the other one, I'm just not leaving for another two years and I'd have well over six figures of student loan debt. But on the student loan debt side, there wouldn't be as much, I guess, societal pressure. I wouldn't have felt like I disappointed my parents by not wrapping up with pharmacy school. But on this side, it was, wow, even though I did leave pharmacy school, this feels also like the right move because of the job prospects and the pay. Well, as evidenced by where I'm sitting here and the things I talk about, I clearly decided to take the calculated risk. I decided that pharmacy school wasn't gonna be it for me. I decided that I'm gonna take a leap of faith. I'm gonna jump in working as a pharmaceutical sales rep in the pharma industry. So it was at least adjacent to my degree. And then I would just kind of figure it out from there. So the lesson here is knowing when to take a calculated risk. For me, it was dialed down. I had the numbers, I had the pros, I had the cons, and it was really just getting comfortable with the idea of, okay, even though this isn't part of your five-year or 10-year plan, which I'd always had up until that point, it makes sense and you gotta trust your gut with it. And for the audience, I want you to consider this. 
employees who stay around at a company on average make 50% less than those who leave because internal hires oftentimes are gated by how much they can make and how much they're gonna get raises on. Whereas external hires, that's a totally different budget. So you might be comfortable where you are, that's great. Or maybe you're not comfortable where you are. Maybe you feel like you're getting underpaid. Maybe you don't understand why the new person who's at the same level ends up getting paid 10, 20K more than you. Well, that largely has to do with the fact that you probably have just stuck around too much. And sometimes it might make sense to make the jump. And guess what? You can always boomerang and come back to your company. And that very much is a play at larger companies where you've gotten to a point where you feel like you're not getting the raises you deserve. So then you go to a competitor or an adjacent field, whatever it may be. And after three or four years, you come back again and you are much higher than had you stuck around for the same amount of period. Though I want to put a big caveat on that. And that is, I'm not saying you should just be willy nilly jumping from job to job to job, hoping for more pay. Hey, be calculated with the risk you're taking. Have somewhat of an idea of what maybe three, four, five years might shape out to be if you were to make this jump to whether it be a competitor, whether it's an adjacent field, a different team, versus just thinking, okay, John says that you should be jumping from job to job to job. Because if you end up just doing that, you might not end up that much further ahead than you might otherwise think. Lesson four, and we're gonna get some audience participation. So we're gonna play two truths and a lie. You tell me, which one of these is a lie? A. At the age of 19, I could squat 400 pounds. B, during my freshman year in college, I went to bed at 9 p.m. pretty much every night. And C, I backpacked South America for five weeks during college. And the answer is, drum roll please. C, I did not backpack South America. I backpacked Southeast Asia for five weeks in college. And now you're probably thinking, how the heck are A and B true? Well, to find out that, Let's go back to junior year of high school. At that time in my life, track and field was my identity. I was obsessed and I was willing to do anything to run faster. That year, we also got a new coach for the women's team, Coach Sully. Although Coach Sully was the women's coach, he had coached top men's programs as well as women's programs in high school and college around the country. He and I clicked immediately. His philosophy of maximum rest, maximum output was music to my ears as a sprinter. And so naturally when he suggested a lifting program that he had trained the Canadian national team with, I was all in. The only catch was it was incredibly regimented and you had to follow it to a T. I'm talking you had to take between four to five minute rests between each workout set and every workout you had to increase weights by 5%. And just to give you an example, I'll throw up what exactly the workout looks like. So you would apply it to a bench press or a squat. You take a one rep max and you would do 80% of that for your first workout at six sets, two reps. And in between each set, you're resting between four to five minutes. And then you would rest two full days. And on the third day, you come in and do six sets of three reps at 80%. Then you go six, four, six, five, six, six at 80% of that one rep max. And then you would go down. You'd go five reps, five sets, 85%. Four, four, 90, three, three, 95. And two reps, two sets at 100%, which was your previous max. And then you would come in and do one set, one rep at 105%. That was a workout. If you failed to achieve any of these workouts, you'd have to go back and start over again. So at the beginning of junior year of high school, I had a one rep max on the squat. I still remember it was 145 plate on each side and 125 plate on each side, which is a total of 185 pounds. My thinking was if I can squat more, I can run faster. And I committed to this workout. I never missed a workout. If the gym was closed, I tried to find a friend's house who had a squat rack that I could go at. And so from junior year to the end of freshman year of college, I did this workout religiously. And it was at the end of freshman year that I did a one rep max test of my squat at 400 pounds. Looking back on it now, that was insane. I weighed 150 pounds at most. I was 19 years old. I was outlifting people who were significantly bigger than me. I was squatting twice my body weight. But if I think about it, it made a lot of sense. I went in there every single day, committed to this workout, and I would just keep at it. Whereas other people would come in, they'd do their squats, they'd do their lifts, but it wasn't really a thing that they were tracking. They just kind of went through the motions of it. And so whether or not they pushed themselves, I have no idea. But this workout forced me to push myself every 10 weeks. That's kind of how long it took to go through. Every 10 weeks, I had to put up 105% more. Every, and if I didn't, I'd have to start all over again, which I did not want to do. The lesson here is that massive and outsized results are the output of just taking small incremental steps bit by bit, because those will eventually compound over time and all of a sudden you're on top of the mountain. But along the way, you might not be able to see it. Along the way, as I'm drudging through these six by six sets at 80%, spending 45 minutes just to do one lift, 
feels like I'm getting next to nowhere. But as I look back, when I tested for that 400 pound squat, that's insane. But it was all attributed to a workout that forced me to get 5% better every time. And there's a twofold takeaway. The first is the consistency. It's the consistency of going in and dedicating and focusing on hitting an achievable goal. But the second thing is recognizing that it will take time. It's not going to happen tomorrow. It's not going to happen next year. It might take five years. It might take 10 years, but it's the dedication to getting there that's going to get you much further than people who kind of just deviate and kind of see, oh, I'm not getting the results. I'm not rich yet. So therefore I'm done. Lesson five. When I was a freshman at UConn, I thought I was going to be a doctor. When I was junior at UConn, I was gonna to go to pharmacy school. When I was in my second year of pharmacy school, I decided that I didn't wanna be a pharmacist. When I was working in pharmaceutical sales, I realized I wasn't making enough money. When I was working in tech sales, I realized that I didn't actually wanna work for the rest of my life. And when I started investing in real estate, I thought all I needed to do was buy 10 or 15 properties and my life would be set. The reason I give you this breakdown is I want you to see progress is very much not linear. 18 year old me would be mind blown at what 31 year old me is doing today. This is not part of the grand plan, but that's exactly the point in life. Yes, it's great to have goals that you wanna to march towards, but you cannot be so rigid to thinking that this is the only way to progress about it. As an example, why didn't I go to medical school? I thought I was just trying way too hard and it was just way too easy for other people. I wanna make my life easy. Why didn't I become a pharmacist? I didn't think I was gonna make enough money. Why didn't I commit to pharma sales? Well, I thought I could make more money in tech sales. And kind of the list goes on. And so in life, you gotta be able to adapt and just realize this path going from here to here is not a straight shot. It is very much curved. There's gonna be ups, there's gonna be downs. And the most important thing that you can do is be flexible and be able to adapt to that and also recognize that it's okay to change your goals. It's okay to change your dreams and aspirations. Nobody is holding your feet to the fire. And if anyone judges you for it, well, you probably just don't need them in your life to begin with. As an example, right now in my life, one of my biggest goals is financial independence and retire early. For the past four or five years, that has been the mainstay. And I'm gonna get there. And what I initially thought was I was gonna buy a bunch of real estate and then all of the passive income from the real estate would come in, I would eventually sell the real estate and then fire. Well, what ended up happening was social media came into the picture. All of a sudden, I might not have to buy as much real estate. I can focus on the social media growth in the exact same thing, invest and retire early. When I get to early retirement, whether it's in three years, five years, 10 years, am I actually gonna like it? I don't know. I think I am. I think I never want to work again. But at the same time, I've seen people retire early and eventually just go back to picking something up. I bring that point up to show you that even though financial independence retire early is very much my goal, I'm also willing to accept that once I get there, maybe it might change a little bit. Maybe it's a semi-retire. Maybe I go back and do something else. I, I don't know. But what's helped me tremendously from 18 to now is being flexible and adaptable. And that's wrap on the video. These are the five lessons that I wish I learned sooner that helped me on the progress to crossing the million dollar mark by the time I was 29. If you have questions or comments, drop them down below. And as always, I'll catch you on the next video. Peace.